Welcome everyone. This is Bill Gibbs. I'll be the moderator for this session today. It's just delightful to have you join us today for the master's virtual information session. And for the next hour to an hour and 15 minutes, more or less, we'll be discussing uh, all of our different programs. We'll be talking about a number of different factors as well. In fact, let me get here uh, to um, the agenda so that we can talk about what we'll be talking about. We'll start with seven reasons to consider capital. And I know that many of you are quite familiar with the organization, otherwise you wouldn't be here in the information session, but we'll cover a few things. Uh, and what makes the university special? And it is indeed very special as you'll see as we go through uh, our slides today. Then we'll go right into the master's degrees and certificates and we'll do that through a faculty overview of the master's programs. We have faculty chair uh, for uh, chair uh, persons for each of the programs here who will be discussing every program that we have and uh, this is a great opportunity because you'll be able to ask questions directly of these uh, individuals who would be guiding and leading your program and we'll be doing that do via text chat so uh, feel free at any time to, to post your questions or your comments and we'll be monitoring those closely as you can see our faculty are already uh, um, weighing in and answering questions. Then uh, we'll talk about some of the very important factors of the application process, how long the program takes, how long, how does it work, uh, the tuition and financial aid, and the next steps that are necessary. And we'll open the floor to questions. Now, again, we'll be handling questions primarily through the text chat. And so you in, can um, enter the question at any time. We'll stop and take the question at the time, but we're gonna leave time at the end of the presentation as well to answer a additional questions. Let's talk just very briefly about the reasons to consider capital. First, all of our master's degrees are online with no residency requirements. Some of the master's degrees will have uh, synchronous classes. Most of them are asynchronous. There's an outstanding ROI. I'll talk about that momentarily, but uh, it is incredible uh, what our, our graduates, the investment that they make into our program, what it has paid out in their career. We have a vibrant and very growing alumni network literally all around the world. Our courses are taught by leading experts in the field. And I think you'll see that even in, in the session today, but uh, we search out to find the very best qualified experts. Many of these are actual practitioners in the field who are additionally helping us by teaching courses. They know what they're talking about. Our students are, are very much like you probably are. That is, you're a working professional who uh, needs to enhance your career through a master's degree but you don't want to stop your uh, career. You can't uh, step away from that. You need a way to work on your degree as you work on your career. This is very important, number six, and that is Capital is a nonprofit, private accredited university physically located in Laurel, Maryland. If uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, the Maryland area, it is about 15 miles north of Washington, D.C., between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. We're located in Laurel, Maryland, but we have a global audience and a global faculty and a global student body. Uh, and I smile as I say that because I work remotely in Austin, Texas. Uh, we have faculty who are literally all over the country and uh, one of our faculty at least is represented today is uh, living in Germany. We have award-winning degree programs. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. Now let's talk about ROI. A uh, capital degree is an outstanding investment in your future. There are, are 4,500 colleges and universities in the United States, in the United States, all the way from the local community college and, uh, and private institutions, all the way up to uh, uh, the major schools like Princeton and Harvard and the University of California. And of those 4,500 colleges and universities, capital is ranked 213th with a 20 year net present value. That is, a of all 4,500 schools, 20 years from now, you are in the top 200 of all those schools. Over a 40 year lifespan, you uh, increase up to the 120th level. This is a report that was published by Georgetown University. What this means is the dollars that you spend on your education with capital uh, return to you many times over 
as an investment in and uh, security into your future. I mentioned also that we're nonprofit, private, and accredited. Uh, we're accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. This is uh, in the United States. Regional accreditation is the highest level of accreditation available to a university, and this is what we have. Uh, the Middle States is our regional accrediting, accrediting agency. We're also authorized by the state of Maryland to offer our degrees all the way from an associate's or two-year degree right up through the doctoral degrees. We're an award-winning institution. Uh, we were the winner of the prestigious SC Media Award for the best cybersecurity higher education program in the United States. I know that many of you are here because of that reputation that we've acquired over many, many years. And, uh, and we'll talk more about that specifically in a little bit. We're also ranked number one in the National List of Master's Programs. Uh, and you'll see in, when we get to computer science that we've recently won an award in the computer science field. And all of our aviation programs are recognized by the Royal Aeronautical Society, the oldest professional society of its kind in the world based in England. Just a few more things about what makes Capital special and our faculty will talk about this in more detail, so I won't cover it in a great uh, detail, but we're educational partners with the National Defense University, IEEE, the National Cryptologic School and the Maryland National Guard. We're a center for cyber research and, and analysis. We're a, a post 9-11 GI Bill yellow ribbon program and we're designated as a military friendly school by GI Jobs Magazine. Experience counts. It really does. We've been at this since uh, night since the 1920s for over 90 years, always focusing on technology. We were the first to develop our network security, now cybersecurity program, the first to offer that program online. Uh, we were the first to uh, uh, offer it at the graduate level. Uh, we're National Center for Academic Excellence. Uh, our um, Dr. Butler will talk more about that. And our programs are primarily asynchronous to help you complete your degree on, and on your own schedule, forgive me. All right, now we're almost uh, time for the faculty to present. A little bit about how our programs work. They're just a little bit different from uh, what you might be used to. We actually offer three semesters a year and each semester has two terms. So we offer a spring, a summer and a fall term a, um, semester and then a term one and a term two. Uh, most of our courses are eight weeks during one term. There are some courses that cover two terms are 16 weeks. Asynchronous classes allow you to take your classes whenever and wherever you want. Can I show up here? Okay. I don't know. I didn't see anything. Let, okay. We got a little bit of uh, feedback from one of our guests and hopefully he has uh, been able to figure out how to log in. Um, and allow you to take the courses when uh, you need to. Typically these would have weekly assignments and when you do the assignments during the week would be up to you. But we always have faculty standing by to assist uh, answer your questions and communicate with you. Uh, here are the master's degree programs. I'm not going to go over each one because that's what our faculty will do. Uh, and toward the end, we'll talk about our joint program that is both a master's degree and a PhD in technology. With that, I want to launch in, uh, oh, I, maybe, but I don't want to forget to this. Uh, we also offer post-baccalaureate degrees. Uh, each of these cert post-baccalaureate certificates, I'm getting ahead of myself, forgive me. Each certificate is 12 credits or four courses. And as you can see, they're listed here. If you will have uh, questions about these, we won't be covering these in any detail today. Uh, feel free to visit our website to learn more about them. The courses are drawn from our master's and PhD level courses. Okay, now it's time for our faculty presenters. We'll be hearing from these uh, six faculty members. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started right away with Dr. Butler. Uh, Dr. William Butler will take over for cybersecurity and cyber analytics. Dr. Butler, welcome. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, to virtual open house. Uh, again, I'm uh, Dr. Bill Butler. I'm chair of the cybersecurity program here at Capital, which program we're very proud of. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a couple of our master's degrees in cyber. Um, 
before we get started with that, again, um, we have a long history with um, NSA and Department of Homeland Security in the Centers of Academic Excellence Program in Cyber Defense. So we're amongst the first group of schools uh, to be accepted into that program, which means that our curriculum uh, has been evaluated. Now we're going through the fourth evaluation um, since we started um, and uh, we do very well in these evaluations because we designed our program to um, cover the knowledge units that are required that NSA and the DHS consider important uh, factors in hiring. So we, we cater to that. We believe in that mission. And a lot of you are either DOD contractors or you're actually in the agency or in the military or even the private sector that follows uh, government uh, rules and regulations. Uh, this program was designed for you. Uh, Bill, can you take, oh yes, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about the Master of Science in Cybersecurity and the Master of Science in Cyber Analytics. Okay, Bill. So the first degree, the Master of Science in Cybersecurity, uh, this is our oldest uh, cybersecurity degree, as, as Bill said. It started as the Master's in Network Security because that's what we thought we were doing uh, at the turn of the, um, the decade, uh, 2000, 2001. It was called Network Security. We've since learned that network security is not all we uh, need to be concerned with. Um, it is a 36 to 39 credit program. Uh, the 39 credit program is for career changers, uh, of those who are coming in from a, um, a, a like uh, career field, like IT or computer science or engineering. And the 36 credit program is the base program for, for, for cybersecurity professionals. So again, as Bill said, we draw our faculty uh, from industry and from government. They are cu currently employed in the cybersecurity industry. They are certified. They bring you real, real world experience uh, into the classroom. And you'll find that even your classmates are a tremendous resource because most of them are practicing cybersecurity professionals. Again, all the experience is being brought into the classroom and shared. Uh, you are much stronger. You're much not more knowledgeable uh, both in the uh, materials that we use. We have hands-on labs. As we're denoting here, uh, these are real world hands-on labs uh, giving you scenarios that you are most likely are encountering today or will encounter very soon. We also uh, emphasize adversarial thinking. Uh, th this is a blue team type program if you're familiar with the red team, blue team. It is cyber defense. However, uh, you become a, a better defender um, uh, if you think as the adversary will think. The, as, as many of you know, the largest hack in the history of the United States, which just happened last year, solar winds, it was not discovered due to um, some uh, fancy billion dollar tool. It was discovered because a human being just like you and I was paying attention and noticed unusual activity on account. And uh, that is what we, um, what we preach here is that it, it comes down to uh, humans are not considered just the biggest vulnerability. Uh, humans are our biggest asset. We need to train you to think as the adversary thinks. And that's what, uh, that's how Solar Winds discovered that hack a few months ago. So we follow the NIST RMF framework, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the risk management framework, where we go through the cycle of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. You will see aspects of, um, of, of that risk management framework in all of our courses. Again, we're fully mapped to NSA, Department of Homeland Security, CAE standard, and we're fully mapped to the domains for the CISSP. So theoretically, uh, as you know, that's the gold standard in our industry for experienced um, professionals. It prepares you to take that exam. Uh, here are some of the job, many, many job titles in our field. As you know, many specialties. This is just a, uh, a select few uh, that we thought are appropriate for our part of the country. De these are averages uh, spread across the country. Here in the Washington, D.C. area, in New York, San Francisco, uh, the salaries are much higher. Um, again, uh, the 39 credit program has two le le leveler courses. So just because you're not um, cyber now, as long as you have a basic understanding of uh, networking, programming, and some hardware knowledge, uh, you'll do fine as a career changer in our program. Next slide, Bill. 
and also our, our latest degree of master's in cyber analytics. Uh, we had to uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, we have a lot of data uh, in our field. Every device generates a log. Every log is important, uh, trying to detect uh, and respond to cyber incidences. There is a lot more data than any human can process. Our security operations centers are inundated with data. Uh, this degree is an acknowledgement that we needed to upskill uh, cybersecurity professionals with analytic skills. And this program uh, actually carries the eight core courses from the MS Cybersecurity and additional four cyber analytics courses, which replace the electives. Uh, I probably should add that to the prior slide that we have eight cyber courses and there's four electives uh, that you can take in the program to better shape your degree. So uh, in that, uh, in these courses, uh, you'll learn uh, basic uh, languages such as Python, um, uh, some of the uh, PowerShell type um, uh, scripting languages are programming. You'll be exposed to Splunk and e Elastic and some of the basics of machine learning and AI. We, we actually have a lab that's a security operations center on campus uh, that we're training our undergrads uh, to get hands-on training. We're also going to implement some higher level uh, SOC Analyst 2, SOC Analyst 1, the undergrad SOC Analyst 2 would be those of you that are in the master's program so that you can uh, help us to diagnose um, uh, the, the status, security status of the lab by helping us to determine if any of the indicators of compromise, as we call them, are, are, um, are going off in the data that we're collecting. So we, we're very proud to have uh, one of the few uh, programs like this in the country. We may have been the first to get there, but certainly we won't be the last. Uh, we all know there's uh, way too much data for any human to process. So we need these tools to help us again. Again, I have to emphasize that our solar winds uh, was not diagnosed by a tool or by analyzing laws. It was diagnosed by an alert uh, analyst who noticed some unusual login activities on one account. So let us not forget that. And here are some of the uh, salaries here. I'm sure they're much higher than what I found, but uh, these are the salaries that I was able to find doing a quick scan. But as you uh, add to your analytic skills, uh, your salaries will skyrocket, guaranteed. Uh, when you see my co colleagues' uh, presentation, uh, the Dr. Steele, I think you'll get an idea of um, how hot this area is, uh, data science and uh, data analysis. Uh, thanks, Bill. So next slide is my point of contact information. If you have questions while you're here today, uh, you can type them in the chat room or please uh, take down my email address and my phone number. And I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. I appreciate your remarks. And um, a question had to come in that, um, have, um, that I'd like you to look at. We won't handle that question right now because I'd like to go ahead and get through Dr. Baker's presentation on the TMBA, but be aware of that and you can feel free to answer that question in the text chat or we'll give you the floor in a little bit. With that, I wanna introduce Dr. Richard Baker who will talk about uh, our various business administration and several other degrees as well. So over to you, Dr. Dr. Baker. Thank you, Bill. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Richard Baker. I'm the director of the master's programs at Capital Technology University, and I work uh, with respective department chairs to provide you the best master's degree programs available. Uh, we have three excellent degree programs in the area of business administration. Uh, they are the uh, Master of Business Administration, the traditional MBA, and two technical Masters of Business Administration, one in business analytics and um, data sciences, and the other in cybersecurity. And if you're seeking to enhance your ability to qualify for a senior management position uh, and eventually become a CEO or a COO or a CTO or other executive officer of a company, or if you are simply seeking a career that is highly rewarding, this degree is for you. And uh, next slide, Bill. Uh, the first degree I'll talk about is the traditional MBA and its core, tradi its core topics include uh, financial management, contract management, organizational behavior, marketing and strategic management, and all the topics that are critical to senior management and leadership. It provides a practical broad-based education and management and requires completion of 36 to 39, degree, uh, 39 credits. 
and the program is flexible. It allows you to tailor the courses to meet your professional needs uh, or to or to follow a predefined concentration. Of the 36 to 39 credits, nine credits are composed of three elective courses, and I'll talk more about those in, in just a moment. Uh, if you have either a recent undergraduate business degree, uh, that means completed within the last five years, or relevant professional experience, it, you may have MBA uh, 600 waived and complete the degree in 36 credits rather than 39. That's the difference. Next slide. The three elective courses I mentioned before uh, may be taken from a list of department approved uh, specializations that are listed here and each specialization contains three courses that give you a, a chance to explore and learn more about that individual industry. Uh, we talked today about each of the respective master's degrees that contain these specializations and Dr. Butler's already covered the uh, MS in cybersecurity. In addition, um, you, you may choose any three courses from the master's degrees as long as they are approved by uh, myself, the director of master's programs. And this approach provides you a unique opportunity to start your valuable subject matter expertise early. So we feel this sets uh, capital apart from other universities in the MBA area. Next slide. The next two degrees are the Technical Master of Business Administration and Business Analytics and Data Sciences and the Technical Master of Business Administration and Cybersecurity. Both degrees follow a core set of traditional MBA course, uh, courses and require completion of 36, to 36 credits or 39 credits if you don't qualify for the MBA 600 waiver. And the difference in the MBA and TMBA is less focus in the marketing and marketing process and high level strategy and a replaced focus on the impact of emerging technology and either the data science or cybersecurity for the appropriate degree. Both TMBAs use the critical courses uh, in data analytics and cybersecurity. And our professors include directors of financial contracting in the government, uh, CEOs of banking institutions and large inst large organizations as uh, entrepreneurs who have founded their own successful companies. Uh, you'll find they will introduce you to real world experience. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to talk about two excellent degree programs in the area of aviation. And these are the Master of Science in Aviation and the Master of Science in Aviation Cybersecurity, which is a new and broadening field of uh, critical importance. Next slide, please. The Master of Science in Aviation degree is designed to meet the growing needs of today's business and government environments where aviation is a major business consideration. In spite of the fact that the COVID-19 has cut the prior growth trend, uh, the industry knows this is only temporary. It's already projecting to double in size by uh, 2032. Uh, this degree requires completion of 36 credits and it prepares you for advanced in management and leadership positions throughout the aviation industry and related businesses um, and also government agencies that use aviation. Aviation professionals work for airlines, manage airports, uh, hold higher level positions in airport security, work in the Federal Aviation Administration or even inspect and evaluate aircraft. And in these positions, um, aviation managers are often responsible for managing budgets, employment, uh, marketing, and other administrative duties, all of which are essential to the success of an airline or a profitable business. And our professors include uh, former airline pilots, military pilots, instructor pilots, uh, fellows of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and even an FAA manager. And if you are flying uh, or uh, aircraft or you're interested in managing fleets of aviation resources or aviation safety or simply like being involved in aviation, then this degree is for you. Next slide. Okay, this is the Master of Science in Aviation Cybersecurity. And again, this degree is for a new and exciting field that is critically important in the avi aviation industry. Uh, it requires completion of 36 credits 
uh, aviation cybersecurity specialists may work in the information and security aspects of airports, uh, FAA traffic, air traffic control centers or towers, uh, airline information security, financial data, or even in the handling and security aircraft data, both airborne and on the ground, ticketing, scheduling, and many more areas. And anywhere that uh, data and computers, networks, and information technology are used. And our professors in this degree include professionals who serve as consultants to the cybersecurity world and have flown in the military and to the airlines. And they will help you understand how to apply cutting edge skills in cybersecurity, leadership and aviation technology to everyday work situations in the global aviation a industry. And this is probably one of the most ex exciting and rapidly expanding fields in the world. Uh, next slide, please. The Master of Science in Unmanned and Autonomous Systems Policy Risk Management. Uh, in contrast to many universities, um, we feel that uh, our degrees should not just focus solely on aerial systems. We feel it's important to be knowledgeable for all domains where unmanned and autonomous systems are used. Uh, air, ground, water, and space. And our degree offers the uh, com important aspects of each. This degree requires completion of 33, uh, 33 credits. Next slide. The degree program is designed to meet the growing needs of today's business and government environments where unmanned systems are now a major business driver in all areas of mobile vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are probably one of the fast, five fastest growing areas with opportunities for managers, operators, engineers, designers, data scientists, and more. Our program provides an advanced management education where the latest unmanned systems concepts are studied and analyzed with intense focus. And this program offers the latest technological developments, applications, and practices in the unmanned systems industry and how they're applied to real real life. Um, the applications where unmanned and autonomous systems are used are include things like agriculture, construction, cargo, cargo transport, filmmaking, uh, wildlife protection, journalism, law enforcement, search and rescue, military, and many more. Uh, you will learn about risk and risk management in the areas of autonomy and unmanned or driverless vehicles of all, of all types and the gathering, storing, transmission, and processing of data and risk associated with privacy and, and sensitivity issues. And our professors include managers of Textron Systems, which is a uh, major UAS manufacturer, uh, researchers, uh, DOD employees, and founders of unmanned system centers at another university. That, that would be me. Uh, the degree prepares you to become an effective manager of a single unmanned system or an expanded fleet of unmanned systems. Um, the world's wide open. Next slide. I think this is my contact information. Yes. Anybody has any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. And I'm always amazed uh, at the breadth of, uh, of uh, responsibilities that you hold within the university. Let's move on now to Dr. Linda Martin, who will talk about the MS in construction cybersecurity. Hello everybody, I'm Linda Martin and I am the chair of safety programs at Capital Tech. Um, I have a couple of programs that I am tasked with overseeing, the first being the MS in Construction Cybersecurity. Uh, this program has 30 to 36 credits and um, I'd like to say that most people getting this degree um, are people who are working within the construction field and are tasked with, with managing and protecting data that's sent um, across uh, many different continents and or within uh, certain locations uh, and keeping that data safe um, from people who might want to be intercepting it. Next slide. Um, the degree provides management education. The latest in construction cybersecurity concepts are reviewed and analyzed. Uh, this, this concept comes from many of my colleagues who have talk, talked about uh, regular cybersecurity. Um, advancements, applications, developments in the construction industry are explored um, and applied to real life industry challenges. And as I said before, most of the challenges in this area are IT related or security related. Um, 
and related to transferring data from site to site or uh, analyzing data that is received in order to make construction prog projects stronger and more secure. Titles in this uh, category for people getting an MS in construction cybersecurity include a director position, um, director or manager of cybersecurity operations for large scale construction firms, or even for medium construction firms that have a lot of data that are being transferred from site to site or back to headquarters for analysis. Next slide. Um, just, just along with those uh, comments on the con construction cybersecurity degree, you can expect to earn anywhere from $75,000 to $150,000. I know that's a wide range, um, but it really kind of depends on the type of firm that you work for, the size, the type of operations, and the amount of data that you need to protect. The other program that I'm gonna talk about a little bit today um, is the MSN Construction Safety. Uh, the construction safety master's degree was built with the Board of Certified Safety Professionals Certified Safety Professional Certification in mind. Um, the BCSP, as it's called, has um, a waiver for students who complete a program that meets the requirements of their entry level exam that, that leads to the CSP, which is called the Associate Safety Professional Exam. This program has 36 credits, it has 12 three credit courses in the program. All 12 have to be completed. None can be transferred in because again, as I said, these uh, courses are specifically um, checked against the Board of Certified Safety Professionals uh, blueprint for that exam. If you graduate from this program, you can expect to get a graduate safety pr pr practitioner designation. The GSP designation allows you to advance to the CSP exam once you have the requisite experience, and that's four years of experience. Um, a lot of people coming into this program will have that experience already, and upon graduating, can expect that they would advance swiftly to the CSP exam. People in the construction safety field um, can range anywhere from a small safety director from in a, in a small firm to a large multinational firm that has several safety professionals around the world working on several multi-million dollar projects. Titles in this, in this suite of, of uh, jobs could be regional safety manager, compliance manager, construction safety manager, or director. And again, as I said, with a construction cybersecurity degree, um, the, the ranges that you can expect to earn from set for salary will depend on the size of the company, where you work, um, and the type of uh, responsibilities that you have. So you can expect anywhere from 75,000 to anywhere upward of $200,000 or more if you work for a very large multinational firm. Next slide. And on this slide is my contact information. Feel free to reach out via email um, or LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to talk to you about the construction safety programs here at Capital Tech. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. I appreciate your remarks. And we will now move on to uh, Dr. Ron Martin, no relation, uh, who will talk about um, the MS in critical infrastructure. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, I want to start off in saying, you know, according to the United States National Infrastructure Protection Plan, or NIP, every nation has an obligation to protect essential functions from five main threats. Uh, the first two uh, is terrorism and cyber. Uh, the Friday before uh, the Super Bowl, this year's Super Bowl, we had a, a water system in, uh, in Florida attacked where we had a, an attacker uh, took over the water system and forced the, uh, the increase in lie in the water uh, that's used to purify from to a very high level. Luckily, like uh, Dr. Butler said, they had an alert operator that saw this happening and was able to cut it off. So from a terrorism and from a cyber threat, those are the first two. Uh, national disasters. Um, you know, we have uh, have had national disasters, but we are we're currently going through some trying times where the failure of an electrical system uh, in three, four, five degree weather 
uh, is devastating Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Uh, what happened is without the electrical power, which is part of uh, the critical infrastructure, it, it uh, basically uh, constrained uh, the water systems. Uh, they could not provide water. They could not provide sewer. Uh, it constrained uh, the emergency services because we had fire departments that couldn't put out fires because the water pressure was low, uh, on and on and on. And as a result of this temperature, uh, the water system, the pipes began to bust. Because we didn't have uh, uh, heat in the houses, um, the, the pipes in the houses began to bust. And then we still didn't have heat, so therefore everybody was in a, an ice cube within their homes. I say all of that to say this, that the critical infrastructure failure in those states, and it's not blaming, I'm not trying to point fingers, but it's a very important piece that we must study and make sure that we're resilient to these types of things. The other, uh, the other, uh, another uh, uh, threat is accidents. That's the big oops. You know what you do or what you fail to do, and then you all have failures based on on accidents. I call it the big oops. And the final one that we all have been living with for the last year is pandemics. Uh, the pandemic really um, accentuated a lot of our systems, our critical infrastructure systems, from an operational standpoint and it did affect our way of life. Next slide. When we look at uh, critical infrastructure, we look at these 16 sectors and all of these sectors uh, are interdependent on each other. They have, uh, they share something with each other. And so one of the things that we kind of uh, discuss within this curriculum is, is how they interdependent, how are they uh, relying on one another how are they kind of uh, reacting? And this next slide will show you, uh, the next slide, Bill. The next slide shows you uh, a little city. And as you look at the city, this kind of depicts uh, some of the things that we look at when we look at a city. You see a stadium, you see a dam, you see roadways, airports, train systems, universities, hospitals. All of these things are interconnected. And one of the things that, that we, uh, uh, you know, as a city, as an entity, we need to really study each of these sectors as it pertains to a city. We have the internet of things that are coming at, 5G, uh, bandwidth, smart cities, cyber physical, and industrial control systems that are all intertwined to, uh, to create uh, the city that you see here. Next slide. Within the curriculum, um, you know, we, it's a 30 to 36 credit program. And uh, we have a capstone portion of it where you will do some research uh, for the degree. I think it's very important. This is a hot new topic. Uh, a lot of people will take Homeland Security, but no, we focus right on critical infrastructure where we feel that's the essence of the protection of our resources. And as you see here, uh, these are some of the, the from Glassdoor last year and they haven't really changed i checked it but the resilient systems director is a hot one because this is how you prepare yourself to be resilient and how do you uh, recover from all of these dev devastating events um this is a a very good program um uh, for for you to, to consider uh, we have cybersecurity in it. We have industrial control systems. We have all kinds of different disciplines within the curriculum. And I'd be more than willing to talk to anybody. And I'll put my uh, information in the chat. You can go to the next slide, Bill, please. Um, this is my uh, this is my contact information. Send me an email. Uh, I'll be more than willing to talk to you about it. And just as a, a final point. You know, I feel really good uh, that this year uh, we have six high school students that are working in critical infrastructure uh, here at Capital Technology University, and they're doing extremely well. One of them is going to a state competition to present her paper uh, in critical infrastructure, so it's, uh, it's really good on that. So with that, contact me. I'd be more than willing to uh, share anything I can 
about this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. We will now go on to uh, Dr. Corey Davis, who will talk about the Master of Engineering Technology. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Um, and you could you could go to thank you. Uh, so just to kind of piggyback on uh, what the Dr. Ron Martin said. Uh, first of all, I'm Dr. Corey Davis. I'm the chair of the engineering programs at Capital. Uh, so very excited to be before you to talk about our masters of science and engineering and technology. Um, our program, uh, you think about it as an engineer, we deal heavily, or, or as engineers, we deal heavily with critical infrastructures. Uh, so that's on a daily day-to-day -day basis. We are impacted you know, in terms of designing our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, uh, working in manufacturing settings where we are designing our airplanes. And we just think about, you know, yesterday I was just watching the news and the uh, the airplane leaving Denver from Honolulu, and it you know had some you know almost catastrophic failure. You know, luckily they were able to get back to the airport, um, but that's a critical infrastructure, and so we deal with the day-to-day -day management of that. And our Master's of Science and Engineering Technology program uh, works towards that in a practical way, and where we truly think about uh, you know a practical design. This is in in essence utilizing the systems development process. And so that means throughout your learning, uh, as well as while working as an engineer or an engineering technologist, are you going to be able to define, design, test, and implement new applications and programs? Are you going to take pride in, in using this process to uh, pre preliminarily conduct uh, cost-benefit analyses, design and implementation, uh, perform system analyses, and realize the project's goals? You're going to divine, design and test new systems, integrate them, and then perform maintenance assessments and evaluate that overall process. So we're packing a punch into our broad engineering technology degree. And our program encompasses about 30 credit hours of coursework that are going to prepare you to respond to the needs of industry, uh, both on the public and the private side. And this coursework considers uh, national and international standards when, you know, we're going to be using the this standards um, to help you get the skills you're going to need to learn, grow, and advance within your current setting. This coursework is going to culminate with a capstone experience uh, that's going to provide a comprehensive project management experience, um, which could actually lead to some additional research experiences or opportunities for growth uh, within your current firm. And in some cases, uh, you might be prepared uh, for entrepreneurial opportunities to work as a consultant and open your own private practice. And, and in some cases, this will require you to maybe obtain some additional uh, certifications. We know that the, the professional engineer license is sort of that the creme de la creme of engineering, but um, the project management professional license is, is, is seeming to rival that nowadays. Uh, next slide. Um, so our engineering or engineering technology is a rapidly growing career field. We see that about 13% growth rate is projected through to 2026. However, if we look a little deeper into this 13% and look at some specific technical jobs, uh, we think about the high end of that or the top 10% of that, uh, we would look at an aerospace engineering technician who can earn as much as uh, what we see here um, based on the 2020 Glassdoor salaries for engineering technologists. Um, but when we look at demand in this area for engineering and technology, uh, sort of the, the high demand areas are in environmental engineering and in civil engineering. And the, you know, typically these areas are often employed in states and local government uh, to improve repair and enhance our country's infrastructure. Uh, you'd be involved in, in planning, designing, and building highways, bridges, roads, and, and tunnels, along with uh, working in commercial settings where you're manufacturing aircraft parts. Um, or dealing with uh, re uh, residential and land development projects. So a lot goes on uh, that in engineering technologies can be broadly defined as. Um, but many companies are actually looking for professionals with advanced uh, technical talent in fields such as manufacturing, electronic systems, and in mechatronics. 
Um, and some examples of, of those job titles that are obtainable um, beyond what you see on your screen, uh, you can have the title of a machine designer. Uh, you can actually manage a warehouse. Uh, you know, we think about Amazon in, in that instance. Uh, you can be broadly defined as a project manager and certified with a PMP license or a CAPM license. Um, you can also be a design engineer. Um, so, so many opportunities to pursue and, and our Masters of Science in Engineering and Technology will help prepare you for those opportunities. Next slide. Uh, if you desire to, to reach out to me, if you want some more insight with regards to our program, um, feel free to contact me via email or phone. And I'd love also the opportunity. Uh, if you would like, I can schedule a you know in-person Zoom setting with you. We can we can sort of candidly talk about what we offer and then how we can prepare you for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. And I'm glad you brought up just at the very end there about uh, the Zoom meeting. Because of the pandemic, um, we've had to limit the amount of guests coming onto the campus, but we love talking to potential students and to others who uh, are interested in our programs. And uh, any of these faculty would be glad to engage with you on phone calls, uh, Zoom calls, uh, and um, uh, work with you to, uh, to, and by email as well, work with you to answer your questions on an individual basis. Okay, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Robert Steele, who will speak to the Master of Science in Computer Science. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, welcome, Paul. Uh, my name is Dr. Steele. I'm the, the Chair of Computer Science, and I'll talk specifically about the MS in Computer Science uh, today. Um, actually, just riffing off uh, some of the earlier comments from Bill, a uh, uh, moderator, in relation to the, the great um, you know, return on investment of capital's programs uh, coming in at around 120 over 40 years uh, out of 4,500 total colleges. Um, uh, interestingly, the MS in computer science has, has been ranked as, as the number 10 in terms of, I guess, value for money uh, for online uh, masters of computer science programs in the country. So uh, I think that's a, a recognition of the, uh, you know, the benefit you can, can obtain as, as a graduate. And, and maybe this is even an underestimate of what's going to happen in the future. So on that front, uh, Bill, if you could flick over to the next slide. Thank you. So, you know, what, what I'm going to start with here, this slide um, summarizes a, a range of, of graduate opportunities coming out of the MS Computer Science. Um, all of the salary figures there are um, from, you know, uh, Indeed or Glassdoor or Forbes from 2020, 2019. So these are, these are kind of the latest um, salary figures. And if you look down that list, you'll kind of pick up at a glance that uh, there seems to be some very, very outstanding uh, career opportunities uh, in this space uh, at the moment. And, you know, what's the big picture? What, what is going on here? I mean, just to, to give a summary, um, I would say that we are in a uh, kind of a, a new computing related boom just at the moment. Uh, it, is, uh, it is focused around artificial intelligence and machine learning. In terms of its impact, um, it, it may be even greater than the, the internet boom, uh, which happened around uh, 2000. So we know that had a big impact on our lives. Many of the largest companies that now exist, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter, amongst many others, only actually started then with the, with the advent of the internet. So I would say we are going through a similar kind of a big, big change at the moment. Um, the, the explanation for these high salaries is that at this particular juncture in time, uh, we have a shortage of the skilled personnel to, to take up the, the opportunities there. And hence, just through supply and demand, uh, that's why we see these highly inflated salary figures. So I'll quickly go through these particular roles and then I'll jump on to our particular program, the MS in Computer Science. So, you know, the first career path, uh, machine learning engineer, um, it's not necessarily something that everyone's heard of, uh, but it is literally uh, somebody who can use these advanced uh, machine learning technologies such as deep neural networks and many others um, applied into particular uh, you know, 
fields, and this is the other key point about this particular boom in computing, it's probably going to be more broad based in some ways than the internet because these technologies are applicable into all sectors um, and at, at many different problems within each sector. So you apply these uh, underlying technologies in finance, health, defense, uh, marketing, um, geology, uh, literally all fields. So there's really quite an explosion of, of kind of uh, things that need to be done and, and, and valuable problems. So machine learning engineer is, uh, you know, being ranked the number one job in the US uh, recently um, and uh, continues to sit uh, at that level. Um, data scientists may be a term that everyone has heard, um, also extremely well remunerated, being ranked the number one job in the US for the previous four years actually by by Forbes, I believe. Um, what's the difference between a data scientist? Probably the machine learning engineer is the term used for those who marshal slightly more advanced machine learning technologies. There are a lot of a lot of overlaps between machine learning engineer and, and data scientists. Both are great opportunities. Computer vision engineer, something that's even more, I think, maybe esoteric to the, the general audience. What is this person? This is again a person who is able to use a machine learning technology specifically on tasks uh, related to image processing, uh, you know, object recognition, uh, all sorts of interesting applications. So for example, at the heart of self-driving vehicles, i.e. Tesla's um, products or other competing products in that area is the ability to process in real time the video images coming to a vehicle as it travels down a roadway, uh, observes via a camera uh, what's in front of it and makes a determination that yes, that's the median strip, that's a pedestrian, that's an oncoming vehicle, uh, or that is an anomalous situation. Uh, it's a very complex area, but it's the basis for that particular industry, the most innovative basis, I would say. And again, that's rem remunerated at, you know, at you know, even, even kind of more rarefied level. Uh, data engineer, uh, all of these processes, all of these technologies and, and innovations are based on large supplies of data, okay? No data, no machine learning. So what we have to have is large quantities of data, integrated, aggregated, uh, marshaled together in a, in a structured way. Uh, this, it turns out to be very challenging. Uh, actually, various estimates place the data engineer to be in, in far greater shortage than even some of these other, other roles. And uh, again, it's very well, uh, already well remunerated. Uh, it's probably going to be on the rise. Uh, again, it's all based on underlying uh, software and data management technologies, computer science technologies. Um, further down this list here, software engineering manager. Uh, this is a more traditional role, essentially a, a senior software engineer. Uh, and then similarly enterprise architect, also a more senior uh, individual in an organization who marshals both the software and hardware needs to meet that particular enterprise requirement. So uh, with that, Bill, if you could flick over to the next slide. Thank you. So as mentioned, uh, you know, the, the program is ranked the number 10, uh, you know, best value for money MS computer science online uh, program in the country. Uh, the curriculum has been specifically designed to have a a, a focus on artificial intelligence and uh, software engineering. So it, uh, you know, it, it assumes that those coming into the program can either begin with a, an existing technical undergraduate program, or if they do not have an undergraduate program in um, computer science, I'm happy to discuss what is the, uh, the best way to, to get uh, started in the program. It's designed to be flexible enough that we can accommodate um, students who have differing level of levels of existing uh, computer knowledge but the goal is and, and the curriculum is designed so that it will get those students to have the uh, highly valued hands-on skills that correspond to the career path that I've just um, described on the uh, on the previous slide in addition we have a, a great industry advisory board that uh, you know it, from organizations like the, the Department of Defense, Joint AI Center, um, various aerospace companies, um, uh, Google as well. And they're just looking for 
skilled machine learning engineers and, and computer science graduates. So if you come into the program and you're good, uh, you have a, a direct step away to those uh, organizations who are looking for you as, as a skilled graduate in that area. Um, maybe just a final note about the structure of the program. Um, it is a, a nice compact degree. It's only 30 credit hours all online. It's very flexible uh, about when you uh, attend it or when you uh, can, can uh, participate during the day. Um, and, uh, and again, yeah, it's, all, it's all online. Um, so, the, 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 and also where, where individuals have specific, dis, you know, we're not gonna go into the details of all of the individual um, courses here, but I'd be very happy to discuss that, that curriculum. Uh, in, in detail with those who are looking for particular aspects. Uh, Bill, if you could flick on to the next slide, thank you. Uh, and here is my, my contact information. So uh, my email address, rjsteel, with an E at the end, at captechu.edu. Um, it's a good opportunity now. If you have any questions, just feel free to uh, place them into the chat. Uh, if you don't have a chance now, then I'd be uh, very happy to uh, to answer any more detailed questions via email subsequently or via, via Zoom discussion if, if desired. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Steele. We will move on now to our final program. We do not have a, a slide for the faculty presenter, but I'd like to introduce Dr. Ian McAndrew, who is the Dean of our doctoral programs, who will talk about a combination program that's both an MS and a PhD in technology. And uh, Dr. McAndrew, take it away. Thank you very much, everyone, and hello and good evening, good afternoon, or wherever you are. As it was introduced, I run the doctoral programs, and we have uh, an alternative here, and this is for people that do not have a master's degree, that they can start on the PhD combination program with their bachelor's degree. It is also, just like the previous one that Dr. Still mentioned, a 30 credit course, where you take five, six credit classes, and you uh, end up doing a capstone in the final class, ideally leading into an area of research that you're interested in at the doctoral level. This is a way where you can technically start on your master's degree and a PhD leading into this. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I'm not sure which master's degree to do. I, I'm interested in the cyber, the electrical engineering, different things like this. This is a way that if you know what your end point is, in this case a doctoral degree, and it comes under technology, you can focus on it from straight away. When you finish with the 30 credits, that leads automatically into the PhD, which is a 60 credit course. This is all by research and it's research focused. The MS part is a classic online asynchronous classes that you go through and build you up and abridges the actual knowledge you need between a bachelor's and starting a PhD. But the PhD is all by research and you can focus on the areas that you want. And just another little plug, at three o'clock Eastern time, we have um, a virtual open house, which is talking about the PhDs and how they work. And in particular, the PhD in technology. If you are interested in this particular one, if you would hang on and for three o'clock and then there's another presentation that we can take you further. But I am cognizant of the fact that we are running out of time a little bit for questions and I will stop here and try to answer any in the chat or come and join us at three o'clock. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much, Dr. McAndrew, for hopping in to, uh, to cover this. And we will talk about this a little bit more in the next session that begins at 3 p.m. Let me carry on now. Uh, we're now moving, we will go past uh, oh, 60 minutes, so just to warn you, but we should be done within the next 10 minutes. Now, how long will it take? Uh, these programs that the master's level are primarily designed to be part-time. Most students are completing their degrees in two to four years. How quickly you finish it will, of course, depend on how many courses you take and whether you're looking at a 30-hour, 30, uh, 30 36, 39 credit program. There are three semesters in a year, as we've mentioned already. Taking two courses per semester will complete a 36 credit program in two years. Uh, Factor in 10 to 12 hours of coursework per week of course per course. And I always tell people, is this an easy program? And absolutely not. There's a reason that our return on investment is so high. And the reason is, is that we uh, value our students 
enough that we want to make sure that the programs that they're taking are completely credible and will actually prepare them for success in their career. Good things are never easy. And this, I would not say this would be easy at all, but doable. It is completely doable. How does it work? Uh, depending on the course and depending on the degree program that you're pursuing, you will either be synchronous, that is same time every week you meet in a live virtual environment using Zoom as we're using now, or asynchronously completely online, turning in your work at the end of each class week. Most of our courses are completely asynchronous. Now there are no residency requirements. We will not require you to visit the campus. Many times our graduate students, the very first time they're ever on campus is to um, participate in our graduation ceremonies. The faculty will be in, in regular communication with you. I think you see this here today, even with the faculty that are represented. Uh, there's a deep spirit of, of care that exists throughout our faculty, and uh, they're interested in helping you and making you uh, a successful student and a successful um, person in our program. When can you start? It's extremely flexible. Courses start every two months. That is every, uh, every term there's a new course. There's six terms per year. As a master's student, you can be actually apply and be accepted at any time. There's a rolling admissions. The courses are eight weeks long or 16 weeks. And then after the filing your, your application, even while you're waiting to determine whether you're accepted or not, you can actually begin courses in the next term. Of course, if you're not accepted, that's the only course you'll be taking. But no, if you've otherwise met the uh, admissions requirements, you'll be able to start your program right away. Here's the tuition and payments, uh, $630 per credit plus fees. Uh, and if you are our active duty military in the US military, we reduce that uh, to $350 per credit hour plus fees. If you're retired military, uh, then uh, we also offer to you a $100 discount or $530 per credit hour. Many of you have uh, served our communities and we like to call those folks hometown heroes. These are people who serve on a community college staff and faculty or who are high school teachers and administrators or emergency personnel such as paramedics, firefighters, or uh, first line responders such as police. These heroes uh, receive a 20% tuition discount for graduate programs and that applies for both the masters and the doctoral levels. Capital has a very unique program called the Blue Ribbon Program, and I don't know of any other school in the country that has one. Maybe they do, but I know that this has been a big boon to our students. The Blue Ribbon Program is really three things wrapped up into one. If you start a program and you're under tuition assistance and uh, from your company, let's say, and you lose your job, we will allow you to complete the uh, course that you're in at the time, that you're attending at the time, and reduce the tuition by 50% as a way to help you out. If you finish three courses with us as a regular student, you are eligible automatically for a $500 per course discount for your next three courses. We do that one because we know that if someone gets through their first three courses, the likelihood that they will continue through the rest of their program is extremely high. And we want to reward that ambition that you've already demonstrated and uh, move you through the next three courses. And typically at that point, you're halfway through your program. Finally, referrals. We uh, convert marketing dollars and give them to our students. If uh, you recommend someone to join us and they are accept they apply and are accepted and s enroll in the course, we will re uh, send to you the equivalent of one free course. And so this is a great boon. If you have a lot of uh, colleagues and friends and you love your studies with capital, uh, that means that a good chunk of your education might be paid for. And again, we're taking our marketing dollars and converting them to helping our students. The Office of Financial Aid, uh, 
If you are a U.S. citizen, we encourage you to complete a FAFSA to determine whether you're eligible for any loans or uh, government grants or aid of any kind. Our financial aid office is always available to assist you. The phone number's here. And by the way, we'll be sending a link to the recording. If you missed the first part of the presentation or if you just want to watch it again, we'll be sending a link to the recording as well as a copy of these slides. So you don't need to write anything down now unless you'd like to, but it's there for you. Now, this is very important, and Dr. Brad Sims has uh, put in the link directly into the chat as well. I would encourage you to copy and paste this link. Uh, join us for a financial aid graduate scholarship session on March 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern. This is the registration information that you need. We'll cover private, state, and institutional scholarships, how to apply, and the deadlines. We know that financing your education is a key component of success, and if you're not able to do that, of course, you can't enroll in a program. So we want to give you all of the help we can in terms of good, valuable, solid information that will assist you on determining how you can uh, leverage your resources and your opportunities to complete a degree with us. And again, Dr. Sims has put this link into the text chat. I encourage you to copy and paste it into a, a document. Employer sponsorships. Uh, many of our students are receiving uh, corporate uh, or government sponsorship, and we work very closely with those individuals to make sure this happens. This is something that we do all the time. About three quarters of our students at the graduate level are on some type of employee sponsorship of one kind or the other or veterans benefits. Uh, and we'll work with you. Just let us know how we can help you. I mentioned veterans. Uh, we have many active duty and veteran students working with us, studying with us. Uh, we participate in all of the major uh, GI bills uh, and you will find that uh, uh, we're well set up to assist you to make sure that anything that can be coming to you that if you worked hard to deserve will come your way in terms of uh, your scholarshiping and living, and, um, living arrangements, your living stipend. I won't go into detail on this. I, we include this slide when we send it out, but uh, basically this describes what is considered full-time and part-time for financial aid and for VA benefits. A very important thing to make sure that you maximize the potential for uh, getting resources from the US government. Next steps. The next thing that you wanna do is to go to captechu.edu and follow the links and to apply. Uh, that application is free. We do not charge for an online application. You will need your official transcript sent to us from a bachelor's degree or its international equivalent uh, from an accredited degree, I might mention. Uh, we'll also want a goal statement and your resume. Uh, now, the part that's highlighted is the most critical. We do not require for our graduate programs the GRE or the GMAT at all. We do not uh, feel that those are, are tests that, that will evaluate correctly how, or I should just simply say we don't need them. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we don't feel like we need them to determine what is best for uh, getting you accepted into the program. You will need to, need to meet specific program requirements, of course. All right. Now, we do invite you, Dr. McAndrew mentioned this, we do invite you to uh, join us for the doctoral virtual information session, which is coming up in approximately 50 minutes uh, at the top of the hour at 3 p.m. It uses the same link, so you can log out and come back in again if you're interested. And no obligation, of course. If you're only interested in master's degree, that's fine. But if you're also interested in looking at our PhD or Doctor of Science programs, certainly would encourage you to join it. And it uses the same link. Now, at this point, we're at the questions. I have not been able to monitor the text chats um, while I've been chatting. So I wanna make sure that I've covered everything. We do, uh, we are officially done. And in a moment, I will stop the recording and uh, release you. And I wanna let everybody know if you would like to uh, stop out of the program right, uh, right now in, in terms of this information call, I mean, feel free to log out at any time. We will remain on the call for a few more minutes to answer questions. Our commitment is always that we answer all of the questions that are out there. So uh, let's go ahead and let me scroll 
And also I'd like to mention if any faculty member have a, a comment that they'd like to verbally respond to a question, uh, just feel free to chime in, okay? All right. I'm scanning the questions now to see if there's uh, any that I wanna, okay. One bill was a uh, Tyrrell asked about the need for calculus uh, to enter the MS computer science. Um, I can inform him and all that uh, we actually updated the uh, admissions requirements and uh, that would not be uh, a, a, a problem in, in uh, applying or getting admission. All right. Okay. So, the, yes. And so, Pearl, I would encourage you to go ahead and reach out directly to... Um, it was Tyrrell, I think. Tyrrell. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I said the wrong name. But uh, the person who asked that question, reach out directly uh, to Dr. Steele if you have any additional questions about uh, requirements for acceptance. I think what I was doing is uh, Pearl had asked a question about courses. Uh, do courses have finals, papers, and exams? And of course, it's going to vary greatly according to the program that you're in and the courses. But in general, yes, you would expect those. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that is that uh, if there's a paper required, we follow as a policy in most of the courses. Of course, there'll be some variations. The APA uh, seventh edition, uh, and also we use Turnitin. So if you're familiar with those um, those tools, that's what we use for our papers and exams. It's a course by course uh, determination as to how papers and finals and exams uh, will occur. Yes, it is left very much up to the faculty how they want to evaluate your success right. in the course. Right. Um, as a question from Melissa, is there a different application process if one graduates from capital or treated as a new registration in general? Um, Cam Newsom, Newsom is our Director of Admissions. He's on the call today, and I wonder if I could ask Cam to respond to that question. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just pulling the question back up. Um, so you're asking if there's a different process after you graduate. Um, yes, yeah, so once you graduate, I mean, you can still do still do a new application. Um, there's not like, you, you, won't, you wouldn't do a, like a readmission. Um, technically, you'd be a new applicant to the master's program. So uh, I would say go ahead and do the new application. And, and yes, we would treat it like a new registration. Um, I also just wanted to mention really quickly, though, if you are a capital student um, at the undergraduate level or graduating soon or have already graduated, there's also uh, an alumni discount and we can uh, get some information to you all about that. Thank you, Cam. I appreciate that. All right. Oh, may, I quickly add, may I quickly add something to that? The beauty of continuing on is we don't have to chase down the transcripts and having worked with admissions, it can be very painful and slow getting transcripts from your previous universities at some times. And it's, uh, it makes it, it removes that hurdle. So we are delighted to see people that want to carry on. And when you finish your masters, I'll be pestering you about doctoral options as well. You raise a very good point, Dr. McAndrew, because in the application process, we are actually capable of making a decision quickly once we have all of the transcripts and all the rest of the application in hand. And it's always the transcripts that slow the process down because uh, many universities simply take their time to, uh, to handle that. So uh, yes, it's a good point. Once everything is in hand, typically a decision can be made very rapidly. All right, are there any other questions? Let's see here. Bill, may I add something then as well? As it doesn't seem to be any more questions. If you do a, a master's degree at Capital and it has 36 credits and you apply towards one of the doctoral degrees, it is possible under conditions that six of those credits can be transferred towards your doctoral degree as well. That depends on the degree and different things, but it's very highly likely that we will be able to transfer six of those. And just adding that if anyone's thinking about longer term as well. A question that did not come up, but many, many times people do ask is, can I transfer any credits into a master's program? And so uh, perhaps I'd like to have um, uh, uh, Cameron Newsom respond to that one again, because that's a question that is so frequently come. It hasn't come up today, but it often does. 
Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, it's it's um, usually not the case that we would transfer anything from undergraduate work uh, into um, the master's coursework. Uh, however, if someone has done some master's coursework somewhere else and maybe not completed it, we would look at those kinds of things, um, especially as elective coursework uh, that can maybe fill things out. Otherwise, uh, there's two kind of uh, schools of thought on this. So you, you, it either fills your previous graduate coursework either fills elective space or we have to look at content match and see if the courses that you've taken before can match up to the courses that you would have at Capital. Um, but there's a, a requirement of a certain number of courses that need to be completed here to confer your degree. Uh, so we want to handle those on a case by case basis. So if you have any coursework that you've done at the graduate level at another school, maybe you've taken a certificate uh, or a couple of courses here or there, I'm absolutely happy to engage you with that and take a look at the curriculum and work with faculty to identify if we have any matches or if we have any uh, elective space to fill out for you. Thank you, uh, Cameron Newsom. I'm gonna go ahead and pitch the next question to you. It's from Pearl. It says, once you are close to graduation, what kinds of companies come on campus or to or for remote recruitment? And what kind of job placement is there for an MS in cybersecurity? And, but Dr. Butler, you may wanna answer that second question. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. The first thing I would say to you is don't wait until you're close to graduation to start plugging your name in there. Um, we do have um, virtual, um, actually this past Friday, we had our, our career fair. Um, that That is is also open to the public um, and open to our, you know, to any, any of the capital students. So you don't have to wait. Um, we typically have a, a whole host of different kinds of companies and um, some of the staples of more of your three-letter agencies like FBI, CIA, NSA, uh, NASA is always a big one um, in terms of uh, some of the other industries, uh, other industries and degrees, Northrop, Lockheed, um, Verizon, there's kind of a long list. What we can do is um, we can also send you a list of the companies or the top employers from, from capital, uh, of capital graduates. I'm absolutely happy to provide that information. And then I'll I'll let Dr. Butler talk about some other opportunities in terms of placement. Uh, he may want to even toss in some information about um, those uh, scholarship programs that we have. Okay, thanks, uh, Cameron. I'd like to recognize all my undergrads that are here today. Uh, thanks for coming out. I see about four or five of you here. Uh, uh, per your name sounds familiar to me. Are you currently at uh, Capitol or have applied before? Yes, it seems like your name is very familiar. But uh, as you said, uh, how um, the, the job placement uh, services here at Capital second to none, basically. Um, we are, as a matter of fact, uh, this coming Friday, we're having um, the the uh, what we call traditionally the job fair, where employers are going to appear virtually and interview um, our juniors and seniors. Uh, but that service is also available to graduate students. And uh, outside of our two um, our job fair, career fair, um, our, our di the director of uh, our, that director that handles that, uh, Connie Harrington, also has a um, also has a job board that includes internships, and it includes uh, employment opportunities. We get um, I probably get requests for interns and employment every week. Every week, someone, either an alum or a company that sees me on LinkedIn, actually sends information requesting students and um, I asked them to put that in the form of a job rec or the intern or internship or send the link and I send that to Connie. So um, if you are a current student um, at Capital or an alum, um, you certainly check in with her and uh, she has new, I guarantee you in cybersecurity, there's a new internship or a new job posting um, in there every week. I uh, have a, a, our, um, uh, we have an alum over at FEMA. Uh, she's looking for like 15 people right now at various levels, either at the uh, entry level or at very senior level uh, cyber risk assessors or to run uh, cyber risk programs or to help uh, FEMA shore up their um, cybersecurity program. 15 openings. So uh, there are jobs out there. It's real because I see it every day. Another addition comment on that um, question of placement post-graduation. Uh, I think uh, all of the programs have uh, industry advisory boards. Um, so for example, with computer science, the industry advisory board, uh, the members are certainly looking for 
strong graduates uh, and members include from Google, from uh, you know, the, the Joint AI Center of the Department of Defense uh, and other big employers. So, you know, I think probably the case in all the programs, if you're a, a strong student, you'll have a very um, uh, you know, nice pathway to connect to uh, those interested in employing you, uh, particularly in the Washington uh, area. Thank you, Dr. Steele, and also thank you, Dr. Butler. I wanted to respond to the question about um, uh, whether our degrees are accepted globally, and the answer most certainly as, as demonstrated by Dr. McAndrew and Dr. Baker is yes, all over the world. These are fully accredited degrees uh, recognized um, for their validity, and especially in the area of technology capital, has gained a worldwide reputation, not just in cyber, but in many areas of technology. So a degree from us is a recognized commodity. All right, I see our time is getting away from us. I do wanna respect uh, all of our presenters today. I'm uh, scanning to make sure uh, that uh, Iris has mentioned Connie Harrington, our Associate Director of Career Services. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Ms. Harrington because uh, she is doing an exemplary job of helping current students and alumni find positions. And um, again, in the main, because of our technological bent, our students have not had any difficulty in finding jobs whatsoever or in advancing their careers, careers beyond for their current position. But Connie Harrington can assist you uh, in that area as well. All right. Yeah, uh, when you, James brings up a good point. When you're looking at cybersecurity and cyber defense, there's very few people to fill all the many slots that are being uh, called on from government and industry right now. Okay, with that, let us go ahead and stop right there. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, pause the recording.